please. Yeah, um, first, thank you very much, Dr. Farmer, for your lecture. Um, I have two questions for you. The first one is related to Rwanda. I'm curious, in your opinion, if uh, President Kagame had not been the president, if someone else had been the president of Rwanda, do you think we would have seen the same or a similar reduction in the prevalence of AIDS and child mortality over the last 20 years? And second, uh, if you could elaborate on the phrase that's been attributed to you, uh, fighting the long defeat. Uh, no and no. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, first of all, on the first question, no. I don't think it would, would have been the same. Leadership, and that's why I mentioned my friend Agnes, um, who is the woman in green. Um, the leadership that I've seen in Rwanda around health equity has been the most impressive that I've seen in any of the 10 or so places where I've worked. So. You know, I, I think it's important to give credit to people who fought to build systems that are Rwandan and institutions that are stronger. And, um, you know, it would be a great mistake to not see that as the number one uh, reason for the success. So that's a very pointed and good question, and I think the answer is no. On the second, second thing, I, I recognize that um, from Tracy Kidder's book. But I, I'm sure it wasn't said with any kind of sense that it was original. See, that's the thing about hanging around with writers when they carry microphones and or tape recorders. He was actually carrying a tape recorder. I said, how did you get all that detail from that, discuss that um, you know, walk? I said, weren't we, weren't we walking up you know, hill and dale? Which, by the way, just shows you how good the trauma surgery I had when I was a med student was, if I could do that. So um, I did say it. He said, oh, no, I recorded it. Um, and then I said to him, did you do that all the time? <laughs> but, you know, the long defeat, I'm not even sure that's the right term. You know, you, 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 when you're sitting around chatting with your pals, um, you know, you, um, sometimes you think about how things are not going the way you want. And sometimes you think, hey, there are some real victories out there. And so although I did say that, I'm not sure that it's true. I just think that siding with the poor means that you're going to face some of the pain and heartache that they do, right? And I gave some very dramatic examples of the genocide and the earthquake in Haiti. And, you know, we can spare ourselves that kind of risk by and large. Not completely. You know, there are, yes, in Japan, there's a tsunami that's devastating. Yes, you know, in the United States, there are, there's Katrina. And of course, those are associated with the same kind of social forces that I talked here, the insecurity. But it's a very different level of risk, as you know. So I think my point in saying the long defeat was merely that there are always going to be defeats. Looking at child survival, looking at some of the problems like AIDS, you can see great victories. Cholera, not so much. Cancer care for really poor people, bad. Major mental illness, lousy. Um, obesity among poor Americans, not doing so hot. So that was my point, is that when you're siding with people who are afflicted and poor, you're going to be close to, to defeat. Because eventually, everybody is defeated in a way. right? But the way you interpret that, I mean, it's just very different to die when you're, you know, pushing 100 or to die in childbirth when you're a 24-year-old woman. And that's what I meant. So that's probably more explanation than you wanted. But I can tell you that I, I find this work very uplifting. And, and my coworkers to be uplifted by it, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farmer, for a great lecture and joining us here at Wheaton. Um, you mentioned at the beginning uh, your interaction with uh, Gustavo Gutierrez. And I was wondering if you could discuss a little more how liberation theology has influenced you and your work, and uh, specifically uh, your emphasis and desire for a preferential yeah. option for the poor. Well, thank you. I was hoping somebody would pick up on that so it wouldn't seem like a gratuitous slide of a very cute little old man. Um, he has a good sense of humor. I wouldn't, you know, say that. But 
I, I would say that, um, that it's been very influential to me and, and, and also comforting, by the way, and instructive. And just some very simple um, ideas that, that I've found useful. Um, the idea of structural violence, which I mentioned. It's not that I go into the hospital in Mirabale or the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and start you know, yammering on about structural violence and how it's related to clinical outcomes. I don't. But to understand why diseases you know, spread so unfairly and unjustly is important, I think. That's been a, a, a key notion. The notion of accompaniment, what's that different from? The notion that instead of accompaniment, walking with someone, you have a beginning and an end. You have a contract. You know, you have a one-hour session, and then it's over. That's not very helpful in this work. The idea that you're going to have a beginning of a project and an end, I haven't found it to be useful. Much more useful is the notion of accompaniment. So you don't really know if you're the accompaniateur, the one who's accompanying. You don't, you, you know, you're not the one who's supposed to decide when the need is over. It's the person or communities being accompanied. And there, you know, their preferential option of the board to me is very powerful. It's so obvious, I guess. And you know, in theology, of course, the, the, there's the argument that Gustavo Gutierrez is making is that God can love anybody, but loves the poor more. And when you think about that idea, not as a theologian, but as a physician saying, wait, Medicine should be for anyone, but it should be especially for those who are sick and poor because they're the ones who need it the most and will benefit the most. And in, we do just the opposite. We give them the least. And so I've taken ideas like that from Gutierrez and then, well, I, I, you know, they, they've prof affected me very profoundly. You know, I, after, I don't know how, how I got to be an expert on Pope Francis, but believe it or not, which I'm not. I would like to be, though. I, I kind of dig him. <laughs> um, I was called by a newspaper uh, asking if they could interview from an article they were writing on this, you know, liberation theology and, and the Pope. And I went, I guess so, but I don't know anything about that. And the question that they, I mean, I did know something, but I didn't want to pretend I was a theologian. I'm a physician anthropologist, okay? That's, I got my limits. But I, he, the journalist who, who's been covering the Vatican for a, long, uh, a while, was an ex, knew a lot, um, asked me what difference would that, because the Pope had, had invited, not summoned, but invited Gustavo, Father Gustavo Gutierrez to the Vatican. And let me tell you, that hasn't happened in 34 years. And uh, so they, they knew I'd just written this book uh, with Father Gustavo and asked me what kind of impact will that have on the Catholic Church? What or should it have? And I said, you know, I don't know, but I can tell you what kind of impact I think these ideas should have on the secular world. Education, public health, medicine, foundations, you know, they're supposed to, development, I said, develop, to me, all development assistance would be strengthened by an understanding of structural violence, accompaniment, and a preferential option for the poor. And that's really where I would lay down the gauntlet, is to say it's the secular world and these institutions that think they don't have to understand equity and justice and what the, they used to call in the, in the church the corporal works of mercy. That's where we need to, I think, really insist that these ideas are important. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Farmer. You mentioned in the lecture that out-of-pocket payment models are ineffective in bringing care to the poor. And I was wondering if you could give us an idea of some models that you've personally found effective in bringing health equity to the poor in your work. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't mean to say it glibly, right? To say, obviously, it's not effective. But there is no data to suggest it's effective. So if the goal is health equity, or even if you had a very narrowly defined goal, we will make sure that all children in the United States are vaccinated against, let's say, you know, fill in the blank, measles, okay? Selling that invariably, selling that 
deliverable or service always fails to reach the goal. So you talk about public investments, right? Now, if, what if you don't have a tax base, like Rwanda after the genocide? Well, they still had the foresight, in my view, back to the first question, to say, we will use this aid money in order to build up our public health and public education systems, which will lead to building more businesses and, and lead to entrepreneurship or whatever the jargon of the day may be, and therefore make us not need aid. If we're educated and healthy, we won't need aid. And that's just where they're headed. They said by the year 2020, they're not going to need foreign aid. And they might well make it, actually. Um, maybe not, but they're moving in that direction. So I think alternatives can be public-private partnerships. I mean, I hate that jargon, too. But to deliver a service that we agree is important. Um, you know, I could, I could say for cancer care or trauma, again, if there's all of this money going into Haiti from people of goodwill, which I believe they are people of goodwill, and, and, but it's not adding up to more than some of our parts, certainly not enough to help manage trauma, anywhere in the country, by the way, still to this day after the earthquake, then don't you think we could have thought of ways to build up a system uh, of trauma care that would be Haitian, that we, in time, with a growing economy, and, and Haiti has had a growing economy, some economic recovery, you could finance. By the way, the, the amount of r money that Rwanda puts from its public budget into healthcare and education is far, far higher than Haiti and is actually in keeping with what are called the Abuja Accords, where they said they would devote a certain amount of their resources to healthcare and education. They've done it. That hasn't happened in Haiti and hasn't happened in a lot of the places in, uh, in the world. So there are steps, and you know, there are, there are other modest steps. You know, there are all kinds of ideas out there about how we could finance healthcare services for people living in poverty. The other thing that I think comes out of careful analysis is that health invest, investments in health, sound ones, are really good for the economy. They, they cause economic growth, not just through job creation and, you know, in the service sector, but because people are healthier and can lead productive lives. Um, the people, the, the, the 10 million people in Africa who are on therapy for AIDS, who are now working, whether as teachers or farmers, they would all be dead by and large, if not for therapy. Uh, and again, I think even if you don't go back to the moral valuation of human life and just look at the economics, uh, that's what's helped turn around um, uh, some of the worst problems that are seen in parts of, uh, of that continent. That's one of the investments. So, uh, again, I'm not an expert in healthcare financing, but it doesn't make sense if we care about an outcome to just leave it to, again, individuals and their families to deal with what are really uh, profound societal problems. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Farmer. Hi. Um, you've hinted a couple times at, in a lot of these partnerships for development, the importance of having people from those communities and from those contexts being the leaders. Um, but in that they are partnerships, a lot of time with people from the West, how do you see some of the power disparities, whether financial or educational, yeah. um, get worked out on the ground? Maybe even speaking from your own experience? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, you're right to use the term worked out because. You know, if I, you were to say, how do I see the disparities, I would say, as staggering. Um, the working out part is, is not a matter of weeks or months, right? That can be an accommodation, an emotional accommodation of such disparities. But if you've worked them out in the course of a couple of months or years, that means you're just emotionally or psychologically accommodating. The way to work it out is to build capacity to address those disparities. For example, if we built a hospital without building a training program for young Haitian physicians and nurses, to me that would be an example of not working it out, right? And uh, I'll just give you another um, emotionally, I mean, uplifting example from last month. Last month I was in Mirbalet, and um, 
I saw an American surgeon. Of the five senior surgeons in that hospital, four are senior Haitian surgeons, and two of them have come back from the diaspora. One in New York, where he was at Harlem Hospital, and where one of your professors worked, and, uh, and the other from France, came back from really good jobs to rural Haiti. So the fact that he's American is actually the anomaly, right? Because we're addressing, working out the power differential also in the senior staff. But what he said to, we had some visitors who had been donors to the hospital, and I was taking them back, and he said, well, I'm not in the operating room right now. I'll take you back to the surgical block, and he did. And he was explaining how the surgical service worked. It's the busiest surgical service in the whole country by far, I'm quite sure. He said it was, and I think all of them do. And he said, I said, how are the interns doing? It's their first year, right? Because you, you'd work it out by saying, wait, I did an internship at a Harvard hospital. I became a, you know, did what I wanted to do in medicine, but they haven't, our Haitian colleagues haven't had a chance to. So we have to build the programs. Anyway, so, so how are they doing? How's the interns doing? And he said, great, they're taking all this responsibility. I told them last week, he said to me, that at the end of their four years of training, they would be the best surgeons in the world. And I believe it. That's working it out. Think about this in education, in need. You know, if, you're, you, know, if you have a house and well, I mean, again, the, dis- the local just, uh, juxtaposition, right, if you, if you, I think more of your house here in the United States compared to the houses that you might see there, working it out involves things like housing, education, access to services, protection from insecurity, social safety nets. And again, that's why I keep on going back to trauma, because to work it out would mean that X number of years from now, when I see a Haitian medical school, student, and there are 60 of them, or every single Haitian medical student who gets an MD in the public university in Haiti, all of them do a rotation at Partners in Health Sites. So I see them a lot. But when I see them and think, if that young man or young woman happened to walk in front of a car, they would have insurance and would recover as I did. To me, that's working it out. It's, ma- it's material, it's not emotional, it causes emotions and psychological, but it's the material difference of our poverty that requires addressing. The emotional part of it, be very d- distrustful if you hear that a student works it out in the summer. That means that it's not really being worked out. And that's a hard lesson. It was a hard lesson for me, and I know it's hard for everyone. Working it out is material. Of course it has spiritual and emotional and psychological impact, but the disparity is not intelligence, it's not, it's chances to have a safe and productive life, and that is not gonna happen without, as you said, education and access to cer- certain services. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, what role does the faith of your patients play in their health in Haiti? The faith of patients? You know, I was obsessed by that question when I was a young, when I was a med student. Um, and I cured myself of it. And I'll tell you why, because, and I, I still hear this all the time from the young doctors and young nurses and others, that the faith of the patients, and also the, uh, another term that bothers me is the superstition of the patients, and not just Haiti, that that's what leads to their poor compliance or adherence and again, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what leads to it. Of course, you find strange beliefs all over the world, in like Berkeley, California, too. <laughs> but again, what their faith, their faith, I think, you know, can console them, right, and, and inspire anybody, right, faith, uh, faith in your religious belief. And, and I think we should encourage that right, encourage people to draw on all the resources that you might draw on or I might draw on and make, make it um, easier for them to do that, but without saying that their faith determines the outcome of their, you know, access to care or treatment, and, or education for that matter, you know, because there's so many, and the reason I say I cured myself of it is because 
it bothered me that there, were, there was an immodest claim of causality being made about belief and faith. And that is that belief or faith or the lack thereof cause a bad outcome from, let's say, acute pneumonia, trauma, tuberculosis, et cetera. What was causing the bad outcome was bad medical care and bad delivery systems. So my own guess, now I don't have to have an opinion anymore. That's what I cured myself. My own guess is that it plays a powerful role in keeping families together and in helping people understand suffering, but that our role is to lessen suffering and insecurity. And to understand, again, what any friend or neighbor or patient, you know, considers important, you know, in their, in their spiritual life, um, but not to make immodest claims of causality about it, um, in, especially in settings of, of poverty and disruption. And again, I wish I could have said that when I was 23. It, I, had to, I had to fight, <coughs> fight for that um, view, I won't call it knowledge, that I just shared with you. So thank you for asking. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, you can clap. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, sir, for your talk. Uh, I just have a couple of questions, and I know that you're not, you don't have an economics background, but I do think that there is some value in drawing insights from other disciplines, too. Uh, you talk about the importance of systems. I wish they'd draw some insights from mine. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, so, so that being said... Um, I agree with you, of course, by the way, that, that you, you, we do need to understand economics, but just to re, uh, restore and know more about it. I agree entirely. Right. But what I'm worried about is the idea of economics as ideology, mm -hmm. you know? If I'm going to have an ideology or a faith in something, it's not going to be in economics. But please, go ahead. Right. Um, yeah, so just on the subject What's of... What's your name? Um, Alex. Um, how would you... Okay, so I know you've talked a little bit about showing that caring for the poor would be a form of um, enlightened self-interest, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I know that early on in your work, like you ran, th you had a lot of problems coordinating um, kind of delivery of systems because of this cost-benefit analysis by different agencies. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of wondering how would you go about, if you were kind of in a position of um, influence to kind of shape policy, how would you incentivize that sort of behavior? Yeah. Well, that's a great question, by the way. And, I, and it's a, the, the critique that I'm making here and that, and that I, I've made a lot is not that cost-effectiveness analysis is bad. It's that people are wrong about cost and effectiveness. They got both parts of it wrong. And because people are mistaking, and I didn't know this either, you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I couldn't have said this, but they're conflating price and cost. It's two different things, right? And it took me a while to say, wait, how do you know that's how much it costs? Where did the information come from? And then you look and say, oh, well, no, that's not cost, that's price. Just to give an example, when we started the HIV equity, and you may know this already, when we started the HIV equity initiative in 1997-98, the cost of treatment for AIDS was $15,000 per patient per year. But that was really the price, not the cost. And we figured that out and said, wait, if we can get it for $600 and you said it cost $15,000, how could you be making an equation called cost effectiveness when there's that kind of variation? And then we thought, does this happen all the time? And the answer was, yes, it does. And it's just coming out in the American press how radically, how radically different cost and price are in the United States. You may have read some of these articles in the New York Times. They're, they're worth reading. You know, every American ought to know about it. Now, what about effectiveness? Effectiveness is changing with, right, with every year, right? You have treatment A less effective than treatment B. So you better be recalculating even your savvy cost-effective analysis every year. How to incentivize that? 
I think that we've got to demand better analysis, better science on cost and effective, not try to get rid of cost effectiveness analysis. Because we, so we can't, if you ask an anthropologist about the social construction of cost, he or she will go into a long, windy tirade, just like I'm doing right now. <laughs> but if you ask a surgeon or an economist about the social construction of cost, they give you a blank stare. I know this from personal experience. So this should be very clear, I think. We have to have incentives to stop people from saying confidently, this is what, this is cost effective and this is not. Instead, we should say, here's our goal. How do we get there in the most effective way and with the least unnecessary cost? We need to make this last question, Dr. Farmer, so that we can get to the reception, so. All right, well, I'm hoping, though, that I'm gonna get to talk to every single person in this room. All 600 of you. You can see I'm having a good time. Alex, come take notes. Hi, Dr. Uh, Weber. Uh, hi. My name is Jessica, and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving um, with an organization on the west side of Chicago doing nutrition education. I'm here with about eight other of my fellow AmeriCorps members. And um, a situation I often encounter is dealing with um, families or individuals who have very strong preferences or traditions or beliefs yeah. that are um, kind of going against the nutrition education or whether it be from my colleagues, sexual education, asthma education that we're presenting them with. So I was wondering if you could give us any advice from um, your time working with different communities in Haiti or um, other areas on, on dealing with such issues of yeah. Tradition and well, I mean, culture. I can give you some advice, but it's more homespun, perhaps, than you would wish. Um, I, I think that wherever we cross a boundary, let's just say of class or nationality or language or personal experience, which is all the time, right? But just there's some people whose personal experience is more like yours than less, right? And when you go across uh, the kind of boundaries that I did just to get here, um, and I'm not talking about, you know, Washington to Chicago to Wheaton, but, you know, Thailand, Haiti, Thailand, Wheaton. It's a long, there should be a direct flight, by the way, <laughs> between when you cross a boundary that, <laughs> nobody's laughing, when you cross those kind of boundaries, then you have to fight for humility, your own humility, one's own humility. Because health education or education to alter the course of events that you know are not good, let's say you're talking about um, any of the problems that I talked about, you're using one modality, education, when in fact several modalities would be needed to really alter the risks. In other words, structural interventions. What are structural interventions? If you want to, you know, I, and I learned this from the Haitians, or uh, if you want to alter risk, let's say, for HIV, and it's clearly related to labor migration and gender inequality, I'm not asking what good does it do to educate people about that pathology. I'm asking, in what order does that rank in terms of intervention that are radical, radically going to alter the risk? You know? And the answer is not number one and not number two. In South Africa and in Southern Africa, labor migration is the leading risk factor for HIV, I think. But how many of our health education in, you know, projects are related to altering risk of poor you know, of, of, of job instability? And the answer is very few of them. We have almost no structural interventions. And the same is true in the United States, you know? Like, if we lecture teenagers about obesity, but their s schools or whatever, I mean, I'm not an expert in this arena, but their choices are restricted to what they, they, they can eat, then the impact of the health intervention or the intervention, educational intervention, is, lim is, is more limited, right? Now, does that mean we shouldn't do health education? No. It means, again, we need to have humility about 
how much it is that we're doing can do for them. And that's very hard to do. And, but I, and I think that is, you know, when we understand, I, I'm sure you all use the term QPE, Quest for Personal Efficacy. I'm kidding. I did put that into the Gustavo book and he didn't object to it. You know, my quest for personal efficacy and yours and every student here, we have to tap that, right? And that's why we have programs like AmeriCorps or Partners in Health or the student organization, some of you are part. That's where they come from. Our quest for personal efficacy to do good in the world. Never deny that. But understanding the impact of your actions and the limitations of that impact is an important exercise, I think. So I think it's consoling to know that that structural interventions are needed and that we're rarely able to do them. Now, you just heard that from a doctor who's a subspecialist, right? I'm intervening at the level, uh, you know, as a clinician or as a teacher of clinicians at a level when they already have the problem that I'd like to prevent. Again, whether that be AIDS or getting in a car accident or dying from, you know, uh, poorly managed diabetes, whatever it is. So I'm not saying that I don't love the work that I do. I'm just saying that's not the only way you can attack poverty and injustice and inequality. And that's, again, that's hard because we conflate our own quest for personal efficacy with what's needed to take on these big problems. And that's hard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.